Thank you. And uh, I'm impressed. All of you are good pioneers who came out in this weather. And we're going to try and finish before it starts again later tonight. Um, as you've heard from Vera, <clears throat> Evgeny Modersov has um, got an intriguing book out. In fact, it was published in January, I believe. Uh -huh. Yeah. With the title, The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom. Now, most of what you see written about the internet is sort of in popular but serious uh, newspapers and magazines tends to be quite euphoric that uh, the internet is going to be a, a tremendous tool for democratizing the world fuller and faster than has been the case in the past. Maybe so, but the timeline may be a lot longer than some of these people that you know because what uh, Evgeny shows with great detail in this book is that authoritarian governments have not been asleep at the switch, are not too dumb to understand the internet, in fact have a whole toolkit of how they are using these new technology and some of its more prominent, uh, uh, in some of its more prominent forms, uh, Facebook and Twitter, to do the opposite of what uh, euphorically we would like it to be the case. Now, we'll get into some of the, as Vera pointed out, it, we couldn't be more topical right now. We've had the internet explosions uh, across the globe and more to come. But before we get to maybe some of the specific cases, mm -hmm. uh, I thought it would be good to, to give the, uh, the, a little bit of the intellectual underpinnings of Ganey's thesis. He's got two wonderful labels. One is uh, cyber utopianism. Mm -hmm. And the second is internet centrism. And the two of these, when you put them together, gives you net delusion. So there we are. <laughs> so maybe you can put a little flesh on those two terms and sure. how they lead to net delusion, what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Well, I primarily wrote this book for policymakers, right? I wanted people who are in a position to influence uh, things like democracy promotion, uh, to be very serious and realistic about the internet. And I looked at some of the assumptions that some of these people made. Including uh, our Secretary of State earlier. Uh, virtually all Secretaries of State, uh, going back you know, to Ronald Reagan's administration. Right. Uh, and I just tried to understand uh, how they themselves conceptualized uh, the power of the internet. And uh, looking at some of their statements and looking at some how, you know, it's how some of the pundits frame the power of the web, you know, I realized that there is this reluctance to, uh, first of all, acknowledge that there is a darker side uh, to some of these uh, tools, that uh, some of them are very actively used by authoritarian governments themselves, whether it's to track down dissidents and protesters, which happens uh, even uh, with the help of mobile phones. Uh, which are very easy to trace, or whether by sporadic propaganda through blogs, through all sorts of other media projects, whether it's by engaging in cyber attacks to exert psychological pressure on some independent publishers. There are all sorts of strategies and tactics that authoritarian governments have developed, uh, which I think have not yet been recognized uh, by people who talk about the power of the web. So a uh, refusal to see that it also empowers uh, the oppressor, uh, I think, is one of the core elements of cyber utopianism, uh, if you wish. Um, there are many other elements. There are many other, I think, uh, sources uh, for it. I think um, one of the reasons why uh, so many policymakers overestimated the power of the internet to change these regimes because they drew the wrong lessons uh, from the Cold War, where, again, I just <coughs> went and traced some of the uh, rhetoric, some of the speeches that right. are made by American politicians. And uh, if you go and track uh, you know, how they even conceptualize the internet, it's all through uh, the experiences of Western broadcasting, uh, you know, Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. It's all about you know, uh, providing uh, the dissidents with better fax machines and better Xerox machines. Now it's 
blogs and tweets, but the function is more or less the same. Now uh, these people can communicate better uh, in blogging as the new sum is dot, and bloggers are the new dissidents. I mean, it's uh, almost you know actual quotes right. uh, which you can go and identify in some <coughs> of these pitches. And I think uh, this particular way of framing the power of the internet also hides uh, quite a lot uh, in the particular metaphors used by politicians, especially here in America, uh, to you know to talk about the internet. Actually. Uh, conceal uh, more than they reveal. You look at the speech of Hillary Clinton uh, a year ago, the big seminal speech right. on internet freedom. Uh, you go and look at some of the expressions that she uses to talk about the internet, and you'll see expressions like uh, the information curtain descending upon the world, uh, uh, you know, the virtual walls replacing uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, the firewalls replacing the, the Berlin Wall. Uh, bloggers as being uh, the next generation of dissidents. Again, those are all real terms and real metaphors through which uh, politicians and policymakers in the West uh, try to understand the web. And I think w when you try to imagine uh, the power of blogging, uh, if the only metaphor you reach for is some is that, uh, you miss that there are a lot of bloggers in places like Russia, or Iran, or China who are actually much more conservative and anti-democratic uh, than their leaders. In fact, those places actually employ bloggers. Uh, the well, government, many, right? Many of them employ, but many of them call bloggers. I mean, there are a lot of people online who, in Russia mm. who are supportive of what the Kremlin is doing. But I was thinking uh, of China, which, which has yes. a group of uh, bloggers which are government employees, essentially. Um, China is fascinating in this regard because uh, it's very decentralized there. It's yeah. every, you know, every local office in every local province have their own new media strategy. And they choose uh, whom to train, uh, what talking points to push, uh, which uh, you know, new media outlets to do it through. I mean, it's all extremely decentralized, but it's also very sophisticated. In some provinces, we do see uh, dedicated new media trainings where some of these bloggers are trained, uh, and you know, they even paid. The reason why they're called uh, the 50 cent party is because supposedly some of them are paid 50 cents for each comment, uh, pro-government comment that they that they leave on. Uh, websites of government's opponents. Uh, so, I mean, that's happening as well. But again, uh, this is not what you're likely to notice if you frame the entire subject of blogging as just the next generation of Samizdat. I mean, we didn't have, uh, you know, dissidents uh, who were working for the you know, Soviet Union uh, on the government's payroll.